So after we finished Desire in Hell at Sunset Motel, Mr. David Bixler at Media Home Entertainment working for Mr. Glenn Green had an arrangement with the Weinstein brothers at the then Miramax and they were uh, putting perfunctory theatrical releases out on titles designated and that was cross-promoting the, the value of the home video and then, uh, the, Mir and, and then the, the, the Media Home Entertainment was distributing a Weinstein product that was original and it was a cross-promotion. Uh, in the terms of that agreement, uh, on the day, Media Home Entertainment launched a lawsuit against Miramax. They made an allegation that the Weinsteins were inflating the budgets they were saying they were spending on their theatrical releases. So the lab's fine, but yeah, if you want to maybe pick that one up again. Okay. Uh, on the day, the, Wein the Weinstein brothers received a, a lawsuit from the Media Home Entertainment uh, Company, and the allegation in the lawsuit was that the Weinsteins were uh, overinflating the reported numbers actually spent on the distribution of the theatrical. In other words, if we spend this much on theatrical, you'll give us this much for home video. And there, in, in, in those years, there was, at that time, in that business model, a direct correlation that if you were to spend so much theatrically, it would guarantee so much in video sales, even if the title was unwatchable. It, it, it had to do with marketing numbers that, aren't, that don't hold anymore. Uh, the world changes. So Media Home Entertainment launches a lawsuit, and, and my title is the first victim of it. Now, it, it's all well and good that I have signed contracts with everybody for Miramax to distri distribute my film theatrically, but they're not being honored. And I get a phone call from the head of business affairs at Miramax, and he's got his tail between his legs, and he's apologetic. He says, this, this isn't me. This isn't my decision. I work here. I've got to do what I'm told to do, and I'm told to kill your deal. I say, okay, then that's what it is. You know, accept it and move on. And so I go back to David Bixler, and I renegotiate. I say, you know, you were really bringing the theatrical to the table, and, and you, you require it in my contract, but you're going to have to advance me $50,000 out of my producer's share and, and I'll open it up myself theatrically. So I, I'm really mortgaging my whole future here because it was the kind of title that that might be all it ever made. And on that particular picture, I didn't take any money for my fee. I was just going to take it out of my share payment at the end. That's how little money we had to make the movie. So I'm working for nothing. I make the movie. The 50000 that I'm probably going to make in about two years on, on release, I now have to mortgage and borrow so that I can open up the title theatrically. As luck would have it, on my opening weekend, Los Angeles decides to riot because of the Rodney King fiasco. And the mayor of Los Angeles makes a proclamation that was only made that week and never before after in the history of the city of Los Angeles that there would be a curfew where no one is allowed out after dark when my movie opened and when my movie plays. Movies play at night. Everybody knows that. So I have bet the farm and all the money I'm ever going to receive in the world on this title to open a movie in Westwood when the city of Los Angeles has legislated that people aren't allowed by law to watch movies in Westwood at night. That was my luck on Desire and Hell. And it was a bloody shame because that movie is a treasure of a picture. Alan Castle wrote one of the best black comedies you could ever want to see. Sherilyn Fenn knocked it out of the park. 